And like I told you, we'll be discussing the state of banking following a new report that was released today. And Kenya is not out of the woods yet, but there is still opportunity for growth. This is according to the Barclays Macroeconomic Report of 2018, the report which highlights factors that slumped the country's growth in 2017, paints a picture of resilience and persistence going into 2018. There's a renewed optimism in the market that 2018 will record and provide a better operating environment given the rebound in the tourism sector, improved agricultural performance, strong public investment, and a general stability in our political environment. According to the World Bank, the safeguarding macroeconomic stability, which is a foundation of robust growth, will require fiscal consolidation through, through enhanced domestic revenue mobilization and reining in on recurrent expenditure. That degree of, of dynamism tends to dissipate. An, adver an adverse fact, uh, impact around financial inclusion, which is sort of so the, the household version of that uh, impact on, on small borrowers. And maybe more esoterically, for those of us who just worry about our personal finances and running our business, but it just makes it a heck of a lot harder to uh, affect monetary policy as well. To have monetary policy working smoothly in an environment where the interest rate drives it, as you move the interest rate, you need lots of other things to move. But if there isn't much credit creation already, then it's difficult to, to impact very much. Well, let's drive the conversation forward now. And we're joined by Jeff Gable, the chief economist at Barclays Africa Group, joining us live from our city center studios. Good afternoon, Jeff. Indeed, interesting times for the banking sector, not only in Kenya, but Africa at large. What were some of the key striking uh, outcomes that uh, you picked up in the report? Perfect. Well, first, thank you for allowing me this opportunity. Second, let me add my congratulations to the governor of uh, the Central Bank of Kenya for Banker of, of the Year Award. What, a, what a, an auspicious day. Oh, yes. But uh, a little bit closer to home, thinking about the report that we've launched today as uh, Barclays Africa. It covers sort of more than a dozen economies in sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya being an absolutely prominent one. And what we're seeing in the data, what we're seeing in our views is that after quite a difficult end of 2015 and into 2016. Uh, 2017 looked a little bit better for the region, 2018 a little bit better still. So we're seeing some of that growth recover in th those areas like Kenya where uh, significant drought was an impact not that long ago. Growing conditions look a little bit better. Elsewhere, commodity prices are a little bit stable. The infrastructure story continues to remain uh, a very promising one and of course the global environment in terms of being able to finance these projects in Africa for the time being looks pretty promising as, as well. So all of those things are helping us here in Africa and sub-Saharan Africa in East Africa and Kenya. All of these things are helping us grow just a little bit more quickly and that certainly feels nicer on the ground. All right. And uh, Jeff, uh, just paint for us a picture of uh, the regional economies, how um, to be precise we know South Africa uh, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria have also been uh, on the radar for a long time now. Of course, bearing in mind that uh, these are some of the fastest growing economies in sub saharan Africa. Well, certainly in your list, if you think about South Africa and Nigeria, they're not necessarily the fastest growing, but they are the largest. And so often for those outside of Africa, looking into Africa, it really uh, regularly is the story of the big ones. So in South Africa, for example, a recession in the early parts of 2017, business really frustrated by the very uncertain political environment, big developments in terms of domestic politics at the end of last year, and maybe a little bit more hope creeping in that 2018 will be a year where South Africa can put some of its difficulties behind it. Probably the same kind of story for Nigeria, hit very hard by the sharp falls in the oil prices not that long ago. As oil starts to tick higher, as the exchange rate markets start to work a little bit better, as the push from the Nigerian government to try to diversify that economy a little bit better, you go from a period of sort of deep recession for Nigeria to a little bit easier growth. Compared to those two stories, South Africa and, and Nigeria, 
the story that in West Africa, Ghana would have new oil production, better electricity availability, an economy growing 6 or 7% this year. Southern Africa, a country like Zambia, great new copper uh, production coming on stream, and real reason to be optimistic there. And then, of course, very close to home. Here is the, the regional giant, the Kenyan economy. Difficult 2017. We talked already about the growing conditions. We should mention sort of the uncertainty generated by the prolonged uh, po uh, period of, of heightened uh, uh, political events. Uh, of course, the impact of the lending caps are still with us here in, in Kenya, but from an economy that looked like it grew maybe four and a half, four point six percent last year, we don't have the final data for the year yet, our expectations as Barclays Africa is that growth of maybe five and a half is likely this year. That's a little bit closer to the country's own five year average, a little bit more comfortable. All right. So picking off from uh, your sentiments, uh, Jeff, uh, we know right now Kenya did take up uh, policy where we did see the interest rates being capped at 14 percent and uh, of course we've seen the banking sector uh, experiencing some uh, volatility a number of banks uh, have actually reported uh, dips in profits and uh, what's in the bigger picture will the rate cap sort of uh, affect credit uptake in the long run well, let me speak here as, as an economist rather than necessarily the representative of, of any particular ba bank, if I, I may. Your interest rate caps, whether they be in Kenya or elsewhere, typically are generated by this desire to somehow push more credit into the economy, to generate more ability for the private sector to go out there and really create jobs. And, and to the extent that that's a goal, there's nothing uniquely Kenyan about it. Across the continent, over different parts of time, many countries have introduced some interventions into interest rate markets. And it's not just here in Africa. We see that in Latin America and Southeast Asia, even in advanced economies at times. So we know that this is a very tempting policy. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the experience across countries across time, interest rate caps tend to do a couple things. By capping the, the level of interest rates, it tends to reduce the availability of financing to a small and medium business. And in many countries, that's really the engine of, of economic growth. It tends to force many uh, would-be borrowers, uh, borrowers out of the hands of the formal lending market and, and into sort of the informal sector, which is far from what the, the policy would like. It tends to stifle financial innovation in other ways, right? And maybe in, in um, more complicated ways, often it makes the central bank's jobs itself much more difficult. If the Central Bank of Kenya looks to help guide the economy through the various positive and negative shocks that it faces, and looks to help guide that economy through uh, moving interest rates up and down, well, in an environment where the interest rate cap means that very few people have access to, interest rate, uh, to the interest rate currently, then uh, that transmission mechanism isn't nearly as powerful or, or nearly as strong. And I should add that those observations aren't necessarily uh, sort of the brainchild of myself. Sure. The International Monetary Fund has <laughs> written extensively on, on the subject. We saw even in the, the months immediately following the introduction of interest rate caps here in, in Kenya, the IMF sort of opined that could be impact of half or 1% of GDP on, on Kenya itself and to the negative from introducing these caps. So it doesn't surprise me that this is still very much a, a topic of, of debate and, and discussion. But from credit creation that was sort of 20 or 25 percent year on year in the half year before the introduction of, of these interest rate caps, uh, credit creation to the private sector in the most recent numbers, less than 2 percent year on year. Very, very little new lending happening. And uh, still tied to this, uh, Jeff, uh, right now a number of African countries are taking up uh, multi-billion shilling infrastructure projects and they're also tapping into foreign debt. And uh, for instance, we're seeing uh, Kenya, one of the economies, uh, attracting some substantial uh, number of uh, debt into the country. Right now, it's, it's actually crossed the 50% uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio. Um, do you feel that uh, the fiscal space in the country is sufficient when it comes to absorption of more debt, or are we really um, punching way above our weight? I mean, this again is not only a, a Kenyan issue. So, if we think more broadly, uh, if you go back 15 years ago, 
African economies, many of them suffered under the weight of very heavy debts that were run up in the 1980s and, and 1990s. And though led by the World Bank and, and helped by the IMF and other creditors, there was uh, this push to uh, reduce debt levels for highly indebted uh, countries. And so on a positive basis, Kenya and others went into the global financial crisis almost a decade ago, went into the global financial crisis with much less uh, official sector debt than did uh, many of our emerging market peers. And that was one of the great reasons why, as the biggest economic downturn the world's economy had seen in the better part of a century, as that hit so many places so substantially, to an important extent, sub-Saharan Africa, and certainly we saw it here in Kenya, was sure. spared from, from the worst of that. Now, fast forward to 2017, 2018, and what we've seen is that many African economies, and certainly it's true here in Kenya, many African economies, many African governments have taken an opportunity of very low global interest rates and lots of money sloshing around the global system in order to finance deficits for wages and salaries or finance new big infrastructure programs by borrowing in, in overseas markets. And whether that's uh, nearing an end this year or next year or the year after will depend a little bit on, on countries and their ability to service that debt, but certainly there's a lot more debt out there today than there was before. It's borrowed from markets rather than from official creditors. It's at market rates rather than it's at concessionary rates. And so at some point here, that very easy money, the idea that I don't need to worry about collecting enough money today to build the things I want today, but I'll collect that money somehow tomorrow to pay for the things I built today. Well, uh, at some point that tomorrow is going to come, and one needs to be very mindful of that, I think. All right. And uh, as we head off to the tail end of the conversation, what sort of uh, uncertainties might uh, trigger economic shocks uh, for Africa and also for Kenya, uh, bearing in mind that uh, we've seen uh, the SMEs being hard hit following the rate cap which came into place. A number of banks have been sort of uh, uh, shying away from lending to this uh, niche market which banks have termed as extremely risky. What way forward really eventually? Well, there's two questions. The first part of your question was is sort of a, a question on, well, what are the risks going forward more broadly to the economies? And then you end up with, um, I think it was Dick Cheney in the US that had this tremendous discussion about known unknowns and unknown and all these. We know that the global economy enters 2018 very, very strong. The commodity prices seem pretty well supported um, and that uh, global labor markets, things doing very well. So the underlying environment looks fairly favorable for us, but we think about risks. There's the risks around uh, a U.S. administration led by President Trump that is just far less easy to read when it thinks about policies both domestic and, and international. Any attack on global trade agreements, whether that be directly with Africa or with the partners that we trade with, mm -hmm. would certainly have a negative impact here. Globally, as interest rates start to rise, we'll get to see a little bit more about just how much of the money that's been flowing to us here in, in Africa has been coming because it's genuinely interested in the opportunities on the continent or whether it's come here to Africa simply because returns have been so low uh, elsewhere. Then, of course, there are the unknown unknowns. You know, what would happen were, uh, the North, were North Korea and, and the U.S. to really come, uh, come to blows? What if the U.K. is unable to organize uh, sort of a sensible exit terms from, from the European uh, Union? All of these things will impact very much the broad environment in which we, we find ourselves in. And then to your second question, sort of this, this uh, uh, sense or frustration that important parts of the economy here are being, uh, in some sense, left behind by finding themselves uh, more difficult to access credit as a consequence of these lending caps. Well, in that environment, I expect this discussion around whether uh, the goal to ensure sort of appropriately priced financing for as much of the economy as possible, whether that goal is being uh, met adequately by the current form of interest rate caps as they were introduced before. I, I think that's going to be a very vibrant discussion as we go through 2018. All right. Many thanks, Jeff Gables. Quite interesting speaking to you. And we definitely look forward to more engagements in the future. That is Jeff Gables, the chief economist 
at Barclays Africa. Just speaking of the recently released report that uh, paints uh, sort of a rosy picture really for the continent. Well,